Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Feynman Technique. Um, today, uh, we're going to be evaluating this integral right here, and uh, we're going to need the help of some special functions to solve this. Um, specifically, we're going to need this function. Um, this is the Fresnel sine integral. It's defined at big S of x, and it's defined as being the integral from 0 to x of sine of t squared dt. And you'll notice that looks somewhat similar to the standard Fresnel, one of the standard uh, Fresnel integrals, um, which usually goes from zero to, well, which goes from, usually goes from negative infinity to infinity. Um, so you can see this is kind of related. And then we're, we'll also need the Fresnel cosine in integral defined. Big C of x is equal to the integral from zero to x of cosine of t squared dt, um, and we, we will be utilizing um, those functions <clears throat> um, in our final answer to this integral. Okay, so first let's define a function of t um, as you, you know, as we usually do uh, when solving integrals with Feynman integration. Now this is kind of a crazy, crazy uh, reparameterization, but um, it's the only one I could find that would work. Uh, I initially tried just putting a t in front of that uh, x squared and then trying to differentiate twice and create a, uh, a differential equation. Um, that, that turned out to be much too complicated, um, if it was even possible at all. Uh, but I came up with this one. Um, and it actually works. And you, don't ask me how I came up with it. Um, I was just, I was playing around with different reparameterizations. Um, I wanted, I wanted some way, I wanted some function um, defined in terms of t and x such that if I took the derivative with respect to t, we would end up canceling that x to the fourth plus one that's there uh, in the denominator. All right. So before we go any further, let's notice that if we evaluate our function of t at the point t is equal to zero, we will recover our original integral because this will become one, this will become zero, and this will become one. So we'll just have one times one times our original integral. And if we evaluate it at the point t is equal to infinity, this will eventually go, as t goes to infinity, this thing goes to zero. So we have that. All right, so using the Leibniz rule for differentiation under the integral sign, we can take the derivative of our function of t directly by taking the derivative with respect to t of the integrand. And the only part that has t's in it is this, this part that I added onto it. So it's going to be equal to our original integral uh, then times the derivative with respect to t of this. And then I just showed what the derivative with respect to t of that thing is. And it turns out to be this, which is nice because that will allow us to cancel that x to the fourth plus one in the denominator, which was the entire point. So our f prime of t becomes this, which becomes this. Take a look at that for a minute if you want. So next, um, we notice that this integral right here is, it's just, it's a variation on the Fresnel integral, or I, I'm sorry, it's a, uh, a vari uh, variation on the um, Gaussian integral, and it evaluates to this. All you would do is make the substitution um, that uh, t plus 1 times x squared is equal to u squared, and you would end up with this, and so, provided you, uh, you're you familiar with the Gaussian integral, which I'm kind of assuming people watching this video are. All right, so that gives us that f prime of t is equal to this. All I did is replace this. I, re I replaced this with what we found it to be.
that we have f prime of t is equal to this. Now, we will use the fundamental theorem of calculus part two on f prime of t, and we will integrate it from zero to infinity. That means this is going to be equal to the antiderivative of f prime, which is just f evaluated at the upper bound, that's f of infinity, minus the antiderivative of f prime, which again is f evaluated at the point zero. Well, we already know what those are. We determined that earlier. Uh, f at infinity is zero, and f at zero is i. So that equals zero minus i. And that in turn, is equal to um, the integral from zero to infinity because don't forget that's what we did. We're integrating both sides of this um, from zero to infinity with respect to t. So we end up with this, which simplifies to this. So i is equal to the square root of pi over two times the integral from zero to infinity of sine t over the square root of t plus one. Next, we will make the substitution that s, uh, I, I picked s for the new variable. Usually I'd, I'd pick u if we started with x, but we're starting with t, so I'll go to s. All right, so s is equal to the square root of t plus 1, s squared minus 1 is equal to t, and 2s ds is equal to dt. So you, uh, performing that substitution, we get the following. Notice that our bounds of integration changed from uh, 0 to infinity to 1 to infinity from that substitution. So that's what we have. Now we're going to break out uh, an idea from uh, the uh, double, or I'm sorry, the angle sum identity for sine from trigonometry. Um, we have that sine of x squared minus 1 is equal to cosine 1 times sine x squared minus sine 1 cosine x squared. And we will uh, replace this with this. Of course, I I'm taking s back to x. So now we have this. This mess right here. All right. So next, you notice I just I just split that up into two separate integrals. No, no biggie there. Now, next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add something to this interval. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, to add the interval from 0 to 1. That would make this entire thing um, the interval from 0 to infinity. And likewise, I'm going to do that over here. I'll show you what I mean. So you'll notice I, I added the interval from 0 to 1 on this integral right here. So that means I have to subtract it. And I did the same thing over here. I added the interval from 0 to 1, so I had to subtract it. But since we were already subtracting this integral, um, we had to instead add it. So this is, this is what we end up with. I, I hope you guys are able to see that. I know it's a little bit small, but that's the only way I could get it to fit on the screen. All right. Now let's recall this. These are kind of, uh, these are half the Fresnel integrals. Um, I've, I've solved these on the channel before. Basically, the, this integral is equal to this integral, and they're both equal to pi, uh, the square root of pi over 8. All right. And let's also remember this. We defined these functions at the beginning. The Fresnel cosine integral in terms of x is equal to this. And we also have the Fresnel sine integral, and it's equal to that. All right, so we are going to use these two. We're going to use these facts and just modify uh, that equation right there. So. That's going to give us this. All we did was replace this with what we know it to be, which is square root of pi over 8. And then we replaced this. This is the Fresnel, this is the Fresnel sine integral of 1. Notice our, our x in this case is 1. So that is just c of 1. I'm sorry, s of 1. And I did the same thing 
over here, replaced this with the square root of pi over 8, and replaced this with c of 1. So that is, and we're almost done, a little bit of simplification, and we are done. All right, so this is our final answer. And it's not like, it's not the most satisfying thing in the world, um, but the uh, cosine and sine Fresnel integrals are, are legit functions in mathematics, especially uh, um, physics and probably statistics also. Um, so this is a legit answer, and I believe it's it's equal to something. It's it's equal to like seven or point seven two or something like that. So anyway, that's the answer. I hope you guys enjoyed that, and we'll see you next time.